thank you to everyone for joining us for the webinar, Effectively Using Social Media to Market Your Trail or Organization. My name is Candace Gallagher, and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 177th webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. And another fun fact, actually, this is our highest attended webinar to date in the 11 years that we have been holding webinars. So we appreciate your interest. Thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, this free webinar, it's being recorded. It includes real-time closed captioning in English and also offers free learning credits. And links for the closed captioning and the learning credit quiz will be in the chat box if you do not already see it there. And attendees will receive a follow-up email with the recording, the transcript, the resources slide, um, with the presenter emails, as well as learning credit details within two days. And uh, lastly, we are saving time for attendee questions at the end of the webinar, but we welcome you to send your questions at any time during today's presentation uh, via the Q&A icon that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And I want to... Uh, Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. I want to thank our webinar partners that not only include our presenters, but also um, our the Bureau of Land Management, the Federal Highway Administration, the U.S. Forest Service, as well as the National Park Service. And I'm excited to introduce our webinar presenters for today. We have Danny Tinker, who is the Senior Director of Digital Communications with Meals on Wheels America. We also have Julie Smith, Executive Director of TREAD um, in Rome and Floyd counties, um, and well, as well as Cecilia Alleman, who is the Social Media and Website Manager with the Student Conservation Association. So I will now hand controls over to Danny to start uh, today's presentation. Thank you, and I'll just, I can't multitask, so I'm going to get over here to the screen. get here to say hello. Um, so hello, so happy to be here to talk about something I love, social media, um, but also really excited to just have a reason to put a cute little robot in a forest. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, and I'll dive right in with um, a little bit about me. Um, as Candace said, I've been doing social media um, for some time right now at the Meals on Wheels America, but spent 12 years at places like the National Wildlife Federation, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, NRDC, um, and the Student Conservation Association. <laughs> so um, I've been doing it for a long time. I'll be honest, it's hard to feel like an expert at any point in time for social media. So you're not alone <laughs> a decade later and it's still hard, um, but that's kind of the fun of it that it keeps changing um, and we keep learning. So um, I am joined today by my six-year-old dog <laughs> who will hopefully nap through this whole thing. Um, born and raised in Portland, Oregon, um, still work here and live here now and pretty biased because I grew up here, but my favorite place to hike is Mount Hood. And I know all of you here today have probably recommendations that um, would change my mind and I welcome all of those as well. So one of the big questions I've always gotten is, you know, we know social media is fun, it's hip, it's cool, everybody's doing it, um, but why bother investing the time and resources um, to be strategic and to make it a priority. And so you may not ask that question because you're here today, so hopefully you already know that. Um, but I'll just go through a little bit about, you know, why it's so important um, that we show up. So no surprise here, but Americans spend an incredible amount of time online, six hours and 30 minutes a day. Um, and this was a few years ago, so <laughs> can only guess where that's out today. But um, that is a huge opportunity to be showing up in a place where um, Americans are just spending a lot of their time. Three in 10 are going on almost constantly throughout the day. Um, eight in 10, at least once per day, several times per day, and 72% of that time online is with some sort of social media app. So again, if we're not showing up in the feeds with our trails and organizations and parks, then others will be. 
Um, the other risk, if we're not showing up proactively, um, is that the brand story kind of gets told in a way that you know you don't really have control over. So it's a huge opportunity to build a community um, and invest that that time. And you might be wondering or not, if you've got this part figured out, then um, congratulations. But um, to just kind of start from scratch here on why even use social media, how do we use social media? And that's going to be up to you and some of the goals for your organization. Um, but here are just a few examples that will likely show up on your list um, and are pretty, a, a really good place to start. Um, so customer service, people are going to go to your channels and this is increasingly true. Um, each year, it, I feel like it's just more and more people going to social channels, even before a website or, you know, calling or chatting or anything else, they're going to the website. Um, I mean, social media channels to um, if they're mad, sad, happy, um, all of that. So being there to be responsive is just incredibly important for building that community and showing them that you're listening. Even if you're not um, posting proactively, it still is a great place to listen and gather some feedback because again, people are probably posting about you anyway. And so it's good to know what people are saying. Um, sometimes it can it can influence content. So, you know, if somebody's posting about you know snakes they're seeing on a trail, maybe you create some content about those snakes so people um, understand a little bit more about your area. You can gather feedback if something's not working um, and take that back to parts of your team um, where that feedback might be valuable, um, but at least letting them know that they're heard in that um, and that someone's there. Some people see social as a, a cold way to interact, but I don't think it has to be that way. You, keep, you really can build loyal relationships with people online. Some of the greatest supporters um, going back to organizations in the past um, have been just purely through uh, Twitter or Facebook and interacting time and time again. And um, those people became loyal supporters so that when we needed something um, or when we had something to say, they were there to listen. Great place to just provide real-time updates, especially probably important for a lot of people um, here today, you know, trail closures or, you know, project updates or, um, weather updates, things like that, great place to provide those and just allows people to get to know you. Um, you can create a voice, a personality, um, and consistent, consistently show up in that way. And important for all of us here, I think, is educating and sharing that information that we want to get across to people. So I just want to make a little note before I dive into some of the platforms that um, you really don't need to be everywhere. In fact, I recommend you don't try to be everywhere. It's too much to take on and you're just kind of um, watering down your presence in any one given area. Um, so what you'll want to do is start with just figuring out who you wanna reach, who do you wanna talk to, um, and then figure out why you wanna talk to them and start making a plan based on that. Don't have to be on all the channels, but find out maybe where some of your people already are. If people are already trying to talk to you on Instagram um, or trying to talk about you on Facebook, maybe that's a good place to start. Um, you can choose one channel, two channels, um, or an amount of time. If it's just you, you might wanna say, you know, I'm gonna spend two hours a week and do as much as I can in that time. Totally fine, start slow. Invest only what you can your time, money if you can, but I know for a lot of us, money isn't really um, an option yet. <laughs> um, but a 200, a group of 200 engaged followers to me is way more valuable than a million followers who aren't listening to what you say um, and just aren't really with you. So keep that in mind as I go through all the channels because there's a lot of opportunity out there, but you'll, you'll just wanna find what works for you. So I'm gonna go through these and they're, they're organized a bit by um, the top corner, um, that percentage of US adults who say they use it. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about each one, but you can go through and kind of read more detail um, at the end of this or something like that and research the ones that really 
stick out to you. But YouTube, if you have capacity for video, and I know that's something not all of us have, but if you do, this site gets 14 billion visits per month, which is bigger than Amazon, Facebook, Instagram. It's the second most visited site on the internet, <laughs> um, only after its parent company, Google. So there's an incredible number of people on this site. So it's hard to overlook it. But again, you kind of need um, an investment in video, which can, can be difficult. Um, if you're considering some of the paid placements, just because of the sheer number of people here, it has been a pretty effective um, place for those ad placements as well. And there's a couple ways to go about it. You can see here a couple of organizations who have um, really created, curated um, solid voices um, on the left here, um, you know, set out to tell specific stories in a certain way. Um, and they have a whole collection of those. That's amazing. That might be the dream. But you can also just, you know, share any information that you have, how to's, um, tips, tricks. I mean, um, landscapes. A lot of you probably have beautiful areas to show that you could even just put to music. Maybe you have experts who could talk about something. Um, and this is just searching, you know, the John Muir Trail and just a few of the videos that um, come up that, you know, seven tips for the trail that has 12,000 views. So um, there's tons of opportunities for things that you might think are kind of boring that you can turn into really compelling um, video content. Facebook, pretty reliable, pretty standard. Almost 70% of US adults say they use it, um, stayed pretty consistent over time, still one of the largest platforms. Um, and it might be where a lot of people come to chat with you. Um, here on in Instagram might be a couple of the places you see more of those questions. You can set up a chat, chat bot um, that automatically responds to some common questions if you're not frequently there, but, um, but it is where people will look for you. Um, I switched to groups a few years ago as part of their strategy um, to make Facebook more meaningful and connect in more meaningful ways. Um, was an interesting shift but kind of cool because groups are really cool. If you haven't checked them out, highly recommend just going and browsing some. Um, you might have groups of your own actually that you run and that's even better. Um, it takes a lot of time to moderate that, but when you've got an engaged group, it can be really valuable. Um, but you can also go out and search for groups that um, talk about things maybe in your area, um, Oregon wildlife, or you know something that you might be able to go in and comment on and share and just be engaged with people um, who are kind of potential supporters and just be a part of that community as well. Um, and it is a great place to just try a small budget of, of boosting if you're creating your own content, especially because um, it is a little bit of a pay to play with, it. I'm sure you've seen with your organic engagement, it can be difficult. Um, but even you know, hundred dollars behind a post um, can make a difference if you're if you're already spending that much time and energy creating a blog post or a video or um, some of your own content. And if you don't have your own content, don't worry because you can also just look for third-party articles that are writing about topics that are interesting, uh, maybe to your community, and adding your own um, perspective about it. Um, so, you know, if there's a weather event or something about wildlife in the area, um, you can share that to the group and or to your page and, you know, share your own perspective on why that's interesting. A couple more examples on how to how do you can use it. Um, you great place to tag partners. They love it. And um, a lot of partners are on Facebook. Um, you'll see it again kind of as a LinkedIn option as well, but they love seeing that. Um, but also just a place to have fun and engage. So, you know, this opportunity with the comment came up because <laughs> they called it a fire breathing dragon beaver. It's a marmot. And just having that exchange, um, people know you're listening, you have a little bit of fun, maybe educate along the way, um, but you're just building that loyal group of, of followers. 
Instagram. If you have visual content, definitely consider Instagram. Um, it might not be as big as Facebook or YouTube, but a great way, to, great place to tell your story. Um, people will go here that probably tagging you, your location or a hashtag. Even if you haven't given them a hashtag, they may have, um, they may be trying to tag you with one. But especially if you're trying to reach this 18 to 29 group, um, an incredible number of them are on the platform. So something to consider. And if you're not proactively creating content or you are either way, um, a great thing to do is just to periodically check some of the places people might be trying to talk about you. Um, so again, a hashtag, you can see just typing in um, part of one, you can see there's a whole list of different tags that people might be posting on. Um, same with locations. You might think, oh, it's pretty straightforward one location, um, but parks and things like that tend to have several locations. So going through and browsing some of those, engaging with posts, um, and you might get lucky and find a photographer or an ambassador who kind of posts about you consistently um, with you know, your own goals in mind. So you can really build some relationships that way because um, they're trying to reach out and, sh and share content about you. And stories, of course, won't spend too much time, but another great option um, are the stories for Instagram and then being able to feature those um, so you can do some strategic stories and, and feature those on your profile so that people see them. LinkedIn, so we're getting a little bit smaller, um, slightly less in, engaged maybe than Facebook in some ways, but more engaged with other groups of people. It kind of just depends. You might just try some of your Facebook content there if capacity is an issue. Um, try duplicating some of that content and see what traction you get. Um, if it seems worth it, keep it up. If not, maybe um, you know change that perspective. But if you're hiring often, trying to fill positions, trying to find volunteers and that sort of thing, definitely a place to be um, and can be really effective with that. They do have some groups as well. And if you have executive level, executive level support um, that you wanna leverage maybe for financial support or partnerships or things like that, um, this might be a place to give them a voice. Couple of examples. They might look a little, a little boring at first, but um, but partners love these, and so don't underestimate the the partner post tagging them. Um, you know, it might only get six reposts, but if PetSmart Charities was one of those, that was a huge win for us. So, um, you know, keep in mind that sometimes it might not feel like the most fun thing, but tagging those partners, and you can certainly do it in um, as much fun way as you can think of doesn't have to necessarily look like the, these, but even these are, are super effective. Twitter, um, so now, yeah, we're getting a little bit smaller with the US adults who say they use it, um, but still some great things here. If you're ever joining Twitter chats that you wanna be, um, be there for um, sharing real-time updates again, um, but also it's, the lowest barrier to access for journalists, media, um, and even elected officials. So if any of those touch on some of your goals, um, it's a place to consider for sure. And on the more fun side, if you are on Twitter and want to try to take it to the next level, um, try to jump on a trend maybe where you're um, a relevant trend um, to try to get some more eyes. Um, and so an example of that, with the Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, the goal was to, you know, obviously make wildlife relevant um, every day for everyone, um, but also to try to break down the view of the agency being stiff and, and you know, not very fun. So great opportunity. Um, I think that I'm not a baseball fan, but <laughs> um, there was, you know, a championship and there was a Cubs parade happening. And I had remembered that this photo was somewhere in the archive. Um, and so just threw out a fun um, tweet on that thread to, to try to um, get some more, you know, 
interest and, and reach new people. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it is fun to try to do that if you're trying to take it to the next level. And then listening and being responsive and having fun in that as well. Um, so some of these probably could have went um, you know, not responded to. Um, so one person says, no, I don't, <laughs> this black footed parrot doesn't deliver happiness. And someone else says, this place makes me want it, this makes me want to stay inside. And just having fun and, you know, trying to interact back and forth and, and have a good time. Um, and then having them both respond back is, and that's really the goal is to have that back and forth where you're building, you know, loyal um, relationships. TikTok, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, it's actually one where Mills and Wells America has one, but decided because of capacity um, that it's not one we use very often. Um, so I'll let some of the other folks speak a little bit more to this one, but 21% say they use it. I'll point out a couple of things to keep in mind if you're not on it to watch for. Um, it did surpass Instagram for popularity among um, Gen Z users, um, and it's the fastest growing app in the US. So something to keep in mind, especially if among your goals are staying up with a certain group and audience, um, this can be an important part of that strategy. It's also been a pretty good place for ad placements um, incredibly for us. So even though organically we, we haven't been super active, we have used it as an ad placement pretty frequently. And then if you're not there, you can still try to leverage it. Um, or if you're there and not very active, you could always try to find creators who are already talking about things that are relevant to your organization. And you know they're on the platform, they know the content, they're already creating the content. And so that type of partnership um, might be able to benefit you if you find someone who's willing to do some of that. Now, just to kind of go through some tips, these are super <laughs> one word tips, but um, really important. Authenticity, these days, people can see right through you if you're trying to cover something up or you're not giving the full story or if you're not feeling very authentic um, and they'll fault you for that. So just showing up with authenticity and, um, you know, that's the easiest way to go anyway. So lean into that and um, people will, will give you credit for that. Um, consistency. So whether that means you're posting a few times a week um, or every day, doesn't really matter the frequency as much, but just be consistent and then following up with that. So instead of just putting something out there and letting it sit um, until the end of time, going back and seeing did anybody comment, did anybody ask a question and, and doing that engagement back and forth. Um, and they'll know that consistency of you showing up. Um, consistency in voice as well um, is really important. People will start to get to know you again and that sort of a thing. Video, video, video. I think we all know this, but video is definitely the preferred um, content type across, if not all channels, most channels, um, and definitely visuals. It's not necessarily something you have the capacity to do, and that's okay. Um, but keep in mind, you don't have to, because of that authenticity that people value so much, you really don't have to pay for a highly produced video. Something with your phone is sometimes preferred. Really short clips um, are sometimes preferred. So um, keep in mind that you can do video without um, a big production budget and that sort of a thing. And then just listen and have fun. I won't go through this whole thing, but I did wanna put a slide in here for you to look at later um, as you're doing some of your own planning for your channels. Um, because a consistent and authentic brand story can make it so much easier to show up on social media in an authentic and consistent way. So um, you may already have this. You definitely know why your park and trail and organization is worth supporting. Um, now it's just figuring out what that story is to tell the public. So again, if you already have that, awesome. Um, just make sure you're using that and staying true to it. 
Um, if you haven't quite refined that, it's worth going through some of the questions and just kind of brainstorming and, and outlining um, what you want that voice and story to be. And these are just a few of the tools that I have used over the years. There are probably millions more now that I don't even know about, but if it helps you get started at all, um, please check some of these out. Uh, Sprout Social is a great place for, um, they have a trends report that has really good information about what people value, especially um, more on the side of that authenticity than number of followers, um, which can be hard to find. So if you're looking for some numbers to take back to your team to kind of prove um, why it's important to show up, they might be a good place to start. They also have a great Facebook group, very active with other people doing social media. Um, but Facebook groups in general, highly recommend you go search through some that um, probably is, there's probably one directly related to what you do. And so surrounding yourself with some of the people doing this every day. Um, Canva, Buffer, and Pixlr are just some of the tools, free tools that I've used to, um, you know, create graphics, schedule posts, um, edit photos, that sort of a thing. But again, you might have other tools that um, you use. And Ho Hootsuite has a digital report as well. If uh, the data here wasn't quite enough and you want to dig in more, they have some great information. And of course, I could talk about this all day, but um, if you have any other questions or this you know, sparked ideas that you wanna talk through or anything like that, uh, please feel free to, to reach out and, and email me and I'd, I'd love to connect. Um, so with that, I will send it over to Julie. Yes, thank you, Danny. All right, let me... All right, let's see. All right, share screens. All right. Thank you, Danny, so much. I hope everybody can um, see my screen. I definitely took some notes from you, Danny. So thank you for that. Um, I was really honored to be asked by um, Candace to be on this social media webinar because I, like many of us, probably have a very love hate relationship with social media. Um, I've struggled mightily to get to where we are. And so just a little bit of background before we kind of dive in to my slides. Um, we are located in Rome, Georgia. We're in the Northwest corner of the state. We're about an hour and a half uh, Northwest of Atlanta, about an hour South of Chattanooga. Um, we have a community of about 30,000 people in the city, about uh, 100,000 county. And TREAD was formed in 2012 when the county government didn't want to go after some Georgia Department of Transportation grant money um, to connect um, two existing trails. So we realized that while the city had been thinking for years about building trails in the community, we have three rivers. So we do have trails that run along the rivers, multi-use paved trails. Um, nobody was really here advocating being a voice for the trails and what and for outdoor recreation. Rome really touts itself and um, brags a lot about quality of life, but they were sort of lacking in terms of um, putting the resources into developing a trail network that connects to other communities. So TREAD formed, we very intentionally stand for trails for recreation and economic development. Um, I don't need to tell y'all, y'all are you know, singing in the choir with me. So y'all, y'all get those, all that acronym and how important that is. Um, but I was president of the board for eight years until coming on two years ago as um, a full-time executive director. So I really love what I do. Um, and I love to be able to um, connect community. And that's also our tagline. So I work for, um, there's six people on my board of directors. Um, and so all that to say is, you know, I'm, I'm like many of you in small organizations, and that's kind of where I'm coming from today, just from the small organization standpoint, with maybe one or two employees, some, some part time, um, we do a lot of work. And sometimes it's hard to fit social media in the day, right? And so again, going back to when um, Candace asked me, I thought me, 
um, because anybody that knows me knows that I'm kind of a Luddite when it comes to technology. So this truly has been an effort for me to kind of get to where we are. And so um, I think the word listening to Danny's presentation, um, the word that keeps coming to mind is manageable. Do what's manageable for you and for your organization because, um, let me get to the next slide, hang on. This is how I felt about social media when I first went down this journey. Um, I've had a Facebook account for many years. I'm sure that probably tells my age, but you know, do we get into Instagram or, or Twitter or Tumblr? And some of these um, platforms, I don't even know what they are. So that's a little bit how I felt. And so to be able to kind of, you know, get through the weeds and figure out how are we communicating? How are we authentic? How do I create content? It's, it's been a process. And so I'm just going to give you all a little bit of, of what has worked for us and our organization. Um, so we use Facebook and we also use Instagram. Um, if you look at the numbers, you might think that those numbers are not fabulous. And kind of back to Danny's point, I think it's okay to just be okay with where you are. I'm okay that we have 2000 likes. I am not necessarily obsessed with numbers. Um, what I try to create is good content that educates people and brings in the followers. Um, Tread got into Instagram a little bit later, um, but we've always had a Facebook account. And so then Instagram is a little bit later. And I do actually have goals for Instagram. By the end of this year, I'd like to get up to, to a thousand followers um, because I now see the benefits of Instagram as well. This is just a picture of our Facebook page. Um, I do try to edit the cover photo. I think that's important to, um, to create some, some new images for people. So that's actually at one of our um, walks that we've had on a recent trail. Um, and I think showing people on a trail, obviously that's, that's our business. So I think that's the most effective, but that kind of gives you an idea of what our, what the top part of our tread Facebook page looks like. So for those organizations that are small, that maybe just have one or two employees, obviously, like Danny said, content is key. And so it's taken me a while to get to, to where we are. So I've kind of, I look at it through the litmus of a, does it educate? Is it within our mission of trails, outdoor recreation, economic development, and transportation? And also, is it helpful? Um, so a lot of times, and y'all know this, during busy weeks, you know, if you have a ribbon cutting or an event or, um, you know, you just go out on the trails and you take pictures, the content generates itself. But on the slower, slower weeks, when I'm really struggling to kind of come up with that organic content, then I just post pictures. So I do a lot of trail etiquette because people are always asking me, you know, do I pass on the left or the right? Do I need a bell? So I think that constantly needs to be out there. Um, and like Danny said too, share posts from third party organizations. Um, those are always good. Um, we are part of Amazon Smile. So that's always an easy go-to of, of, hey, if you buy on Amazon Smile, then, you know, what 5% goes to tread. So, and then of course, trail pictures and videos. So those are just kind of some things that I always go to. Um, and I also have to set goals for myself or I'll, what I've realized is three or four days will go by and I will not have posted anything. And so I really need to be mindful of setting goals three to four times a week minimum. And you know, people are so oversaturated. So I don't want to oversaturate people with content content and post, but I think a good, I, I think I've settled on that. And this is going, um, this is Facebook and Instagram. So I try to do posts on both because now you can, which is hugely helpful. And then also those of you who are on Facebook, if you use the business suite, the scheduling feature, it will tell you when the best time to post is. And that's sometimes, honestly, I look at that and other times I think I just need to go ahead and post. Sure. I should look at the metrics and sometimes I really don't. Um, but honestly, until Facebook and Instagram merged, I think many of y'all might feel the same way. It just 
felt like one more thing to do. If you're managing Facebook and then you have to do Instagram, but now as many of y'all know, you can post simultaneously. And that makes a very, very big difference in terms of time management. So this is just an example from this past May, but uh, Facebook um, will the Meta Business Suite, you can kind of study your audience habits and post accordingly. And like I said, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, but it does give you a quick snapshot of how many people have liked, how many people have shared. So you can look at some quick metrics, which is helpful to post. Then if some of you are struggling to come up with content, this is kind of my cheater way in the summer when I know I'm gonna be busy. Um, I'll just stick to these hashtags. Um, you know, Monday motivation, posts that are inspirational, Wednesday wins, you know, um, pictures, highlights, Friday fun facts, could be about the trail, could be about um, what's coming up, just anything like that. And then kind of on the, the alternating days, just miscellaneous posts, reminders, upcoming events. So this has been really helpful to me. I probably use this less, but in the beginning, when I was trying to feel my way through this whole new land, this was really helpful to me. Um, kind of also, so real-time updates is hugely important. And I share this because this certain, this section of trail at the bottom left, it, you see the Redmond Trail connection. This was actually the reason why Tread formed 10 years ago. So it was a quarter mile of a trail and it was federally funded. So those of you in federal world know probably why it has taken 10 years. But so excitement was building the closer it got to that trail construction finally being finished. And so until this was actually the biggest post that has had the biggest reach. So 8,900 people were you know, reached by this post. And so that just kind of tells you the impact that you have. Um, and I love looking at all the, all the different metrics. Again, I don't study these, but you know, when new trails are being built, any updates, anything like that, your audience needs to know. So that's why it's so important. So uh, Danny talked a little bit about Canva and I think many of y'all probably use Canva. And Many of y'all might know that if you are a nonprofit, you can apply to have Canva Pro, a Canva Pro account for free. So Tread has done that and that's been really helpful. Um, but I show you these because there almost is sometimes too much of Canva. Um, so you can post all day long, but what I figured out is people really want to see real people. Um, and so I was in preparing for this um, presentation, I was looking back through my our Instagram. So on the left hand, you'll see, I just took a screenshot. I'm a little embarrassed, but I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you, there are nine Canva posts on this screen, nine Canva designs, and that's just too much. And so now what I've done, and here's some tips, is I have, I reached out a couple years ago when we started Instagram, and I reached out to a friend of mine who's a recent uh, marketing college graduate. And we literally had Instagram 101. I didn't have an Instagram personal account and I still don't. I just maintain the one for Tread. But it, she was so helpful. So I really encourage you, if you students, marketing people that you know, really pick their brain. Because this might sound silly to y'all, but I really didn't even know that you needed to stick with a theme. And so... Obviously the theme is trails, right? But I ended up coming up with a color scheme. And so any student workers that I have work with me, I'm very clear with, if you post something on Tread's Instagram account, we need to stick to our logo colors, earthy, blue, green, browns. So to the left, it's just a disjointed mess of Canva posts, terrible pictures that I've taken. And, but then on the right, I feel like hopefully you can get a sense of what the theme is in terms of colors, the images look more professional. Maybe other people don't notice it, but now I do notice it. So before I post something on Instagram, it really needs to be under the litmus test of 
Does it look good? Is it a high quality picture with a good filter? And does it stick within our color, color scheme? So just my tips, and this goes back to, I think the whole point of this webinar is take a deep breath. Social media can be very beneficial, but it's a lot. So figure out what works for your audience and don't try to do any more that you can do within your capacity. And to the second point, you can't do it all. So stick to one to two platforms and learn to do them well. I used to think that I wanted to do TikTok and I don't have the capacity for videos. And I've finally just learned to accept that. So I feel like we're reaching who we wanna reach. There's always more people, but I think that we have built our audience to where I'm, I'm finally satisfied with it. Um, I'd also be remiss if I didn't talk about a little bit about constant contact or MailChimp or any email marketing. That's been a great add-on feature for us. Um, I typically send probably two to three emails um, to, our, to our group a month. And then I also pair that with social media posts. So it's constantly getting your messaging out. You always want to be top of mind to your audience. Um, and again, use your Facebook post and likes as reactions as a guide for your fundraising ask, because really what you're doing is trying to build a loyal following. And so sometimes what I'll do is go back and I'll notice, oh, this person, Roland Arnold, for example, always likes what I post on Facebook. And so if you're comfortable and if you can find somebody, we're in a small town, so most people know people. So use that to kind of guide your fundraising efforts to a degree. Um, you know, maybe Roland wants to be asked to give money. Maybe not, that's fine. It's your job to make the ask. It's his job to say yes or no, but kind of use that to look for who you might wanna ask for donations. Again, free Canva Pro for nonprofits um, and be a communicator. Commit the time to read the comments and answer the questions to get out in front of the, to alleviate misinformation. And so the public knows what is really going on. And also spend time making your profiles professional and education. It's your brand. And Julia, are you still with us? I know that was her last slide though. So just in case, um, Cecilia, if you wanna start sharing your screen, we'll have uh, you. <laughs> um, I think it was good timing though. So go ahead. Absolutely. All right, just a second here. Sure. And I wanted to mention real quickly too, thank you to everyone for sticking with us. I know that um, we do still have a presentation from Cecilia with Student Conservation Association. We may stick um, around for a few minutes after the hour to answer more live Q&A questions. Um, so thank you guys so much and go ahead, Cecilia. All right, thank you so much, Candice. And even though I can't see or hear Julie anymore, I just wanna say thank you for turning it over to me. And thank you, Danny, also for your insights. It's really great. Danny mentioned she did work for the SCA at one point in the social media role. So I'm really happy to be following in her footsteps and for the last three years have followed in her footsteps. Um, so it's a really, really exciting place to work. And a little bit about me is that I've been at the SCA for three years now and I work in the Washington DC area. So with the SCA, there are a lot of stories to be told. And before I jump into that, I just wanna give folks a little bit about our background for those who maybe haven't heard of us. So the SCA, also known as the Student Conservation Association, our acronym is the SCA. Our mission is to build the next generation of conservation leaders while also inspiring lifelong stewardship to the land through hands-on conservation opportunities for young people. So we have youth and young adult programming at green spaces all across the United States, which include national parks, state parks, local parks, wildlife refuges, national forests, Pretty much any urban green space or green space you can think of, there has probably been an SCA member or an SCA crew who has worked there to improve the space. 
So they work on crews, cores, and as individual interns on different conservation projects that include trail maintenance, invasive species removal, historic preservation, um, education and outreach. So just to name a few of the many different areas they work in. Um, we also hope that their experience is transformative and inspires them to continue serving public lands or just kind of sets them up on their career path or even connecting with people and the people they've had a chance to work with while serving on these public lands. And it also helps protect public lands for future generations. Um, so we were founded in 1957 by Liz Putnam and we are very excited this year to be celebrating our 65th anniversary. We are also celebrating a huge milestone of placing 100,000 members into the field. So we're looking forward to continuing that momentum into the next 65 years and for the next 100K members. So a little bit about SCA's social story, which has probably changed over the years, just as the social landscape has changed. We are on all of the major platforms, but they are not all created equal. So we definitely have more engagement and larger followings on other platforms compared to, you know, for Twitter, for example, which I have down at the bottom of this slide as our declining platform, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but across the board, we have two major demographics that we are our primary audience that we talk to. So we have our older generations and cohorts, maybe boomers in that group that consist of our alumni, donors, maybe parents of active members or recent alumni that kind of fall into that category. And you will find a lot of them mostly on Facebook. And then we also have this large demographic of young people because that's what we are all about in our mission. So we kind of have to stay up on the social trends and what's going on on these newer platforms because that demographic is so large. Our members are out there, they are active and they want to interact with us on these platforms. And we know that that's one of the first ways we'll be able to reach them. So across the board on our platforms, predominantly you will see that we have a female identifying audience as our majority, but it does kind of switch up. Twitter, we do have a male identifying audience as our majority, um, but it's always shifting. And this is probably pretty common for a lot of other nonprofits and different organizations out there. Um, so it's nice to see that shift and to see that we are with conservation being a very traditionally and historically male dominated field, kind of having that different audience there. So we're definitely paying attention to all the different groups we're speaking to and hoping our content reaches as many of them as we can. So quickly into LinkedIn, which I will jump into some more detail about what works for us on that platform. LinkedIn is currently, and oddly enough, our fastest growing platform. And that can be for a variety of reasons, but we are steadily seeing increases in growth every week by about a hundred followers. And our other platforms, we really don't see this significant increase as frequently. And specifically Twitter, we see a few followers here and there and even people dropping off. So right now our audience for, all kinds of reasons is really honed in on this platform. So we wanna take advantage of that and see what we can do with our content. And so far for the past year, a lot of our content has performed really well and had high engagement rates on LinkedIn. So a bit of a deep dive into LinkedIn. Traditionally, this was a career oriented platform. It was built for job seekers, recruiters, you know, people looking to network and for that next opportunity. But now LinkedIn has kind of transformed into this space that's very similar to a Facebook type of space. You have a news feed, individual users, brands and organizations can post updates. So that kind of opens up the window for all types of content. And our audience on here kind of goes across the board. We have a nice blend of different age groups and different industries, but predominantly the environmental services industry. So while we do try to post all kinds of different content and experiment with different types of content on this platform, what we have found works the best are success stories. And this is something that looks very similar to what Danny showed in her presentation when it comes to before and after photos. People really love to see a newly constructed bog bridge on a trail and the trail that wasn't passable before. You know, it's something that shows an accomplishment or an achievement, which very much resonates with the LinkedIn community and the platform itself. 
And then for example, over here, this image that I have is a post we did on one of our DC crews who worked at a local park to install ADA compliant grills and picnic tables. And this is one of the posts that resonated the most with our followers. We had very high engagement rates and a lot of shares. We could show this work that was accomplished and also the smiling faces and the people behind that work, which is very similar to what Julie said in her presentation about showing the people. This is also a great spot just because of the kind of platform it is to kind of showcase and acknowledge and give kudos to our community. So these are our alumni who a lot of them go on to become superintendents at national parks where they go on to start their own organizations where they're connecting youth to nature. And that's something that we want to celebrate. So whether it's a link to an article or just a photo of them with a shout out with text, that's something that our audience really loves and really likes to share and engage with. So all those stories that we can find about people in our community, even our own internal staff at SCA when they get accolades or they have a speaking engagement or they're being recognized, that's something we want to share. And it's something Thing that our network really, really just loves to see. And so we will continue to post content like that while also experimenting with our other content because this platform is our fastest growing. So we have a lot to gain and not a lot to lose when it comes to that. All right, so Instagram. This is my personal favorite for the SCA specifically because it is a very interactive platform. And it has kind of migrated over from just being a photo post very you know basic type of platform to a platform where you can show a day to day for organizations and brands and this is in instagram stories and through reels so we really like to take advantage of that visual component and that video component and post stuff to our instagram stories very consistently and these tend to do a lot better engagement wise for us versus just a regular still post or a permanent post as some will call it so we have this large young cohort. We have millennials, we have Gen Z, we have members who are active in the field that are tagging us in content on Instagram, hoping that we share it on our stories or we repost it. So this is a platform that we've really kind of honed into and it is one of our most engaging, not necessarily growing, but most engaging. Um, so one of the examples I wanna talk about with how we really utilized Instagram's interactive features through stories is our Parks Pandemonium campaign. So this is SCA's version of NCAA March Madness for public lands. So we nominate several different public lands, parks, spaces around the country, put them together, create a bracket, and then ask people to vote for their favorite. And the way we drove this campaign on social was through Instagram stories. All users had to do was click a little button when they went through our story and that would tally up the votes for us, making it very efficient for us to get those scores, but also it helped us really engage with our audience. So we were going above and beyond just that simple post. And Instagram stories allow you to add polls, add quizzes, you can add music, links, all kinds of different things. So people can take an action and participate rather than just scrolling through your feed. There are some limitations depending on how many followers you have when it comes to some of these features, but there are so many fun things you can do. And so I definitely recommend exploring that and it really drives that interaction. And then TikTok, the latest and the greatest. So piggybacking kind of on what we have with Instagram. We have this very large young demographic and they are on TikTok. So we knew this is something we wanted to at least try to explore. And in doing that, we wanted to get to the goal of what's the benefit? You know, are we trying to use this as a recruiting tool? Are we using it as a fundraising tool? Are we doing a combination of things? And ultimately we just wanna tell stories because there are so many stories to SCA, whether members, alumni, public lands, there are so many stories to tell. So we did a little you know, research and tried to figure out what worked best and what that secret formula was. And we came up with this idea for a trail recipe series. And this was created by one of our former interns who also happens to be an SCA alum, Ingrid Pina. And she did a really wonderful job putting together a series of TikTok videos where she shows us how to make different recipes that she cooked for her crews while serving with SCA multiple times. So she's talking about her experience, what it meant to share this experience and making this food with her crew. And it's just something that's really feel good and kind of ties it back to our whole mission. And then at the end, we put a little plug into our website to check out opportunities. So it was a really, really, really exciting 
exciting time to kind of dive into TikTok and get our feet wet with it. So I have an example of one of the videos that she did. It is the apple cinnamon oatmeal breakfast that she cooked, and I'm gonna play that for you now. Good morning. Today, for our crew breakfast, we're making apple cinnamon oatmeal. Oatmeal is a popular choice for crews in the morning because it's easy to make, people can add their own toppings, and it's filling. It'll give you the energy needed to work on your conservation projects until lunch. On my crew in Glacier National Park, which is situated on the indigenous lands of the Blackfeet people, we would take turns making the oatmeal in the morning, and usually people would grumble wanting a few extra minutes in their sleeping bags before getting up in the cold. But one day when it was my turn to make the oatmeal, I got out of my sleeping bag, got out of my tent, and saw a moose. It was huge and beautiful, and if I hadn't gotten up early, I wouldn't have seen it. Breakfast tasted extra delicious that morning. As always, remember to follow Leave No Trace principles when outdoors. Visit thesca.org for more information on Leave No Trace and on crews and cores that you could join. So I hope you're hungry now after watching that. We do have lunch and dinner available also on our TikTok and our other social media channels. Um, but just kind of tying it back, TikTok is not a place where we've seen a very significant amount of followers grow and kind of tying back to the two other presentations, it's all about content and we really want to create quality content. So just because we're not posting on it all the time doesn't mean that it doesn't work. And we can also cross promote that content. All these videos you can save, add them to your Instagram stories, to your reels, to your Facebook, to your Facebook stories. Um, so you can really make the most of that. And it's just another way for us once again to connect. Um, so lastly, just dropping our social handles in here. Um, and thank you again for taking the time to listen. Social media is ever evolving and ever changing, and it really varies for all different organizations. So what I like to recommend is just experiment as much as you can, because you never know what might happen. And Candice, I will go ahead and send it back over to you. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Cecilia. And really thank you to Julie and to Danny as well. I know that we did go over a little bit and not allowing enough time for live Q&A, but we will stay a little, uh, a few minutes after the hour just to answer some of the questions. But don't worry um, if we do not get to your question during the live webinar. Um, I will work with the presenters to answer all of the questions in writing um, if time allows. And of course, you are also welcome to reach out to the presenters um, individually if you would like a, a little bit quicker answer. Um, I'm kind of summarizing. There's a question from Sam that came in, which I know um, others are, are asking about as well. But essentially, um, just in regards to picking the best time of day, you know, I know, Julie, you had mentioned that, you know, you kind of do work off of the um, what Facebook and Instagram kind of mentioned as the best times of day. And so I am curious for like Cecilia and Danny, um, is it best to, to kind of go with what they're suggesting um, or, you know, does it not really matter? Like what's your perspective on that? It's kind of an imperfect science. <laughs> um, it's a great way to go if you're just going and you need to choose something and sure, might as well go with the most popular times that their algorithm is picking, picking up at that time. Um, but if you have a little bit more time and want to play around with it, um, I've seen something where, you know, we didn't talk about it, but recycling content, if I post it one week at 5 p.m. and then three weeks later at 10 a.m., they have dramatically different um, responses. So it's hard to tell exactly, but you might see you might see trends more in terms of, you know, people being, I've seen communities generally more online in the morning or generally more online at night, generally more active weekends. So you might see trends like that, but the specific the specific dates um, or specific times um, are hard because they're hard to track down. They're different for every platform, but they are a really great way if you're just kind of in a rush and, and need to schedule it and have it pick the best possible um, time that you can. Okay. I would agree. I think that Definitely, we've used those tools that are built in to try to see when our audience is most active, but this is a tricky one since everyone's on different time zones, but we definitely try to maybe 
focus on like when people are maybe getting up in the morning or they're on their lunch break, like what do those hour windows look like in different time zones? Those are times they more than likely will be scrolling through their phones on their feeds or looking at our feeds rather than during traditional work hours. Um, so that's just a strategy that we've kind of looked at and we've definitely seen on weekends and things like that where people do have time to look at their phones. There is more engagement there. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, this question I think came in when Danny was presenting, but it could be for, for everyone. Um, but Rain is asking, you know, they are a local government and have strict restrictions on their posts. And so comments are always off. Do you have any other ideas for increasing engagement in that case? That's a really tough case to be in because just the way that, you know, especially for me, um, social media is such a relational um, back and forth. Um, it's such a relational tool that that's, that's a really hard position to be in. Um, you know, at the Fish and Wildlife Service, I can't imagine if the comments were turned on off, how that would, how I would kind of go about getting engagement. You still have likes, you still have shares. Um, I would consider who makes that decision and having some conversations with them <laughs> Not that you're trying to take on a, a whole nother um, big project, but you know it is it is kind of a big part of the engagement for you know social media. But at the very least, you're there to provide a lot of valuable information for people, um, and so you can still do that and make sure people are seeing that through all the engagement numbers um, that that come through in there. Um, Kathy has a great question. You know, explain using hashtags a little bit more, please. Whoever might be able to answer that. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say Cecilia, maybe, because <laughs> has so many good ones. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to jump in. I mean, hashtags, once again, they're made to group your content together and have your content seen, especially when there's some sort of trending topic um, or event or anything taking place. Um, so when using hashtags, though, you really want to identify which are the ones that are most relevant to your brand and your organization. So, for example, SCA, we have a few hashtags that we like to include on all our posts because we know that it'll group us within the conservation community, but also are kind of unique to us in a way. Um, so the two that we commonly use are hashtag serve the planet and hashtag protect the planet. Um, so those are, are two that can kind of go back and forth between what our mission is, but also what other groups are doing. Um, so kind of identifying, you know, what works best for your brand. There are different tools you can use in Sprout and other platforms that will help you identify some of those hashtags too. But I think they're very important and you definitely want to use them on all your posts. There are some times where I do recommend avoiding them if, you know, the topic is sensitive in nature or there's something going on, you know, that everybody is chiming in on and it's more about just having a voice um, and not necessarily having your content seen. Um, but definitely look into using them as much as you possibly can. Great. Um, I wasn't sure if any of you guys had mentioned this, but Bo is asking, do you, you find Facebook ads for events are worth the cost? Any tips to increase, you know, clicks or buys with Facebook ads? Do any of you use those? I do. Um, I think it, it gives you options to um, edit the demographics. So I think that's important. I don't think you want them to just be blasting to everybody. Um, it has been effective. You know, I think I've I set a limit. I think I've only spent $40 max. Um, you know, we're a nonprofit like many of y'all. We don't have a huge budget. So I do find it uh, helpful. I do use um, it judiciously. I don't do it for everything. But if we're having a big fundraising event and I want the word to get out to, you know, friends of friends who follow our page, then I will use it. And somebody did ask a question. Um, they said, does Facebook bill you or do you have to have a credit card on file? And you have to have a credit card on file. And so far I've not seen any fraud. They've, they've billed me the exact amount of whatever, you know, cost that I, that I wanted to use. So I'm, I'm okay with that. And I think it can help in some instances. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Rain has a question about what advice do you have for captions? You know, things like length and actual content. 
you know, comparing the different uh, platforms. Um, Danny, maybe if you have any suggestions for that. Yeah, so just so I'm understanding, um, mixing up the captions between different platforms. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm reading it as, yes. Yeah, um, really good question. One that I think people are kind of split on, um, so I'll give both perspectives. Um, so if you have all, a lot of time and energy to spend into creating you know, content for each channel, um, there are ways to optimize a post based on each channel, certainly. Um, but if you're kind of limited on time, um, then I haven't seen a negative result from using some of that same content across channels. There are ways you can mix it up. Maybe you add another sentence to um, the Facebook one because you have a little bit more space, um, or maybe you post them on, um, you know, I mentioned, you know, doing posts multiple times over a couple of weeks. So you can, maybe you do it one day to Twitter, the next day to LinkedIn um, and mix it up that way. Um, so some people really like to take that time to customize it per channel. Um, I think if you're strapped on time and resources that, you know, keeping it kind of consistent across and finding other ways um, to mix it up that, that nobody will um, penalize you for that. The exception maybe being um, Instagram and, and TikTok, that would be, you know, those more visual ones are a little trickier to, to do that with. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Michael has a question if you have any advice for, you know, if you have an upcoming event or like a trail ride, how long before do you advertise it? Um, Julie, I'll have you maybe answer that one first. Any advice? Um, well, you know, Facebook makes it so easy to post events and obviously it's free. So I think as soon as you know you have something coming up, go ahead and put it out there. We have monthly walk and talks that happen the last Saturday of every month. And I plan those probably seven or eight months out. Um, and so I don't necessarily put, well, actually, no, I did. I put all of those up. I know that seems a little silly, but I've got all my events from August through next March. They're all out there. So if anybody wants to see them, but I think what that also does though, is that makes your organization look like you always have something going on. So a lot of it is smoke and mirrors for small organizations. Um, I want people to think that, you know, I'm, we all are working hard, but I think it just gives you an added, um, you know, kind of a professionalism too. So mm -hmm. I say, as soon as you know, unless it's, um, you know, two years out, just go ahead and, and put it up and start getting the word out. That's awesome. my thought. I'm wondering if okay. Cecilia or Danny have any other thoughts. Yeah, I would say the sooner the better. And just in terms of Facebook events, you can create the event and then a lot of your followers might get notified that the event has been created. But then you also have to make the effort to share that event on your own platform, on your own channels. Um, so I think the sooner you iron out and get that skeleton of that event up, you can go back in and you know modify it if you have to add new details or links or graphics. Um, but just to kind of get that information out there so people can take a mental note or save it, um, to their calendars, I think the earlier the better is definitely key. Great. All right. Um, let's see. We'll do one more question. Um, sorry, um, they keep coming in here. <laughs> um, one more question, um, just in regards to authenticity, question um, for Danny. Um, since I know she had mentioned that earlier, um, what tips do you have for maintaining authenticity? I think it goes a lot to who's managing the actual channels. Um, so that might just be one person who's doing all the social strategy to completion. Um, you might be doing just a part of it, um, but whoever is actually putting that content out there is the voice of your organization. Um, and so they really have to embody that and understand it and feel it so that it starts to come out um, pretty authentically from their voice. And so I think a lot of it is just kind of developing that voice and being consistent with it and um, practicing. And if that person who's, who's managing it um, understands it, I think it'll come out 
um, pretty uh, automatically, but Cecilia and Julie, do you have other thoughts on that as well? <laughs> Well, and I know in the past we've had student workers or interns um, and and in, in the past I've given them reins a little bit, but I've backed that off because I just, I you're the face of the organization. It's your brand. So I think you're right, Danny, just being that authentic self in your post and, and kind of keeping that same messaging um, makes a big difference. So I would say if you have it's a little tricky in my opinion to have several different admins. You've all got to be on the same page and it's just easier to have one person be that voice, I think. Yeah, I agree. And there are times where specifically for us, we do have members who, you know, we want to give them a voice. We want it to be an authentic voice. So while we're overseeing the process, we want them to be able to tell their story as authentically as they can. So, you know, we potentially will give them control. We will plan everything, of course, um, but let them do, you know, an Instagram takeover where they're on our stories at a project site, like showing us the day in the life, you know, what they do with their morning stretch and then out on the trail, you know, their lunch break. Um, so there are moments where we kind of just do loosen up the reins a little bit, um, but for the most part, you know, we do have that one or that core group um, that's overseeing and managing. Great. Well, I really appreciate uh, your time, Cecilia, Julie, Julie, and Danny, and thank you to all the attendees that stuck with us. Really appreciate it. We went over time just a little bit. Um, we do have more uh, questions that we will need to answer. And again, I will work with the presenters and share the Q&A as a resource with attendees once that's um, finalized. Um, and again, I also encourage you to reach out to the presenters in the meantime, if you, if you have a, a question you'd like a quicker answer to. So you'll see this slide here on the screen. We'll share this in the follow up email. There's a lot of links on this slide, a lot of great links though, um, that I will share along with the link to the recording and uh, with the closed caption transcript within a couple days. And again, I want to thank our partners of the webinar, um, that include the Bureau of Land Management, the Federal Highway Administration, the U.S. Forest Service, as well as the National Park Service. And if you are enjoying our webinars, uh, please consider donating as little as $5 by texting I'm for Trails to 44321. Your donation will go to our Trail Capacity Fund, um, which is a grant program of American Trails, and we are opening up the next round of applications in the fall of 2023, so keep your eye out for that. Um, um, and we will select a couple people who donated immediately following our webinar to receive our Trail Boss mug as a thank you. Um, and lastly, uh, we encourage you to register for these upcoming webinars um, that are free along with free learning credits. So thank you again to everyone for attending. We hope you um, all enjoy the rest of your day and happy trails.